that's looking to less than two. And yours truly wrote one that, yeah, come on to responsibility and take the performance of that responsibility yeah. during the fire, which was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 not a lot, but yeah, a handful of test first not coming out of the annual requirements for coming in three seasons, but then that one, what role did the test requirements fall in? Yeah. Well, they're logistic, they're not trying to fight fires, but they still have great logistical support. Yeah. You know? What type of skills are they yeah. during the fires to yeah. Yeah. Well, it was the first time they called up down in Zulu. Yeah, yeah, and the very tight bond between the sailors on that boat and the immune system. They got to go on back again. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Are you waiting for us to start? I'm just working out the last little. Good. Kinks in the slides, and then we're pretty good to go. I was worried I didn't find meeting glasses. My decent glasses are only if I'm sitting in front, I might just know that I'm sitting. I'm at the meeting with us, right? And it's kind of after this. Right. So if I'm wearing them, I'll rock them up and I'll find out if it's just like a meeting. I guess. Oh, look, there's now a whole bunch of folks here now. Yeah. yeah, so 40 ish minutes and then 20 minutes QA. Yeah. Welcome everyone. My name is Professor Robin Eckersley. Um, I'm in the School of Social and Political Sciences in the Faculty of Arts. And it's my pleasure today to introduce Professor Christian Downey. This is the first um, Melbourne Climate Futures Academy seminar of the year. So you are our number one guest for the year. Um, Christian is an associate professor in the School of Regulation and Global Governance at the Australian National University. And before that, he was a DECRA at um, a fellow at ANU. And before that, he was at the University of New South Wales. Christian has a well-deserved reputation of one of Australia's leading, um, I guess, energy governance scholars. That's, that's how I'd slot you, but that's not all that you do. Um, he's worked across a whole range of different areas, actually, with the, on, the, on the climate energy connection. Um, he's published more than 30 peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters, and his latest book is Business Battles in the US Energy Sector. Lessons for a Clean Energy Transition. And we want to hear as many of those lessons as possible because there's a slight uptick in activity here in this country at last. So today, um, Christian's going to address us on the topic of money, strategy, and policy, how to design ambitious climate policies that overcome industry opposition. So the floor is yours, Christian. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, let me start by thanking um, Professor Robin Eckersley for hosting me and to Theo and Bill for organising. Thank you very much. Um, as Robin mentioned, I'm based at the ANU and I've been working on thinking about, uh, I guess, the politics of climate change for uh, well, probably more than a decade now, working in think tanks, government and more recently universities. And much of my work has focused on thinking about how do we overcome opposition, political opposition from incumbent industries that I guess have done a lot to obstruct action on climate change? So too often, I think we know that when uh, governments set out to implement climate policies, they often lose the political battle. Uh, of course, we've seen that uh, too frequently here in Australia. We're all familiar with the climate wars, uh, 
Americans and Europeans have witnessed the same thing. Um, and we all know what climate change failure looks like, right? We were just talking a moment ago about the bushfires that were black summer fires, the floods that have been tearing up and down the East Coast. We've seen what the failure of policy to keep up with the science looks like. In the, uh, in the energy sector, just get rid of them. In the energy sector, it looks like this. This is the share of total energy supply across the globe. If you look at the first pie graph on your left, you can see in 1973, around about 80% of total energy supply came from fossil fuels. The crazy thing is, if you fast forward 50 years, it hasn't really changed. It's still 80%. Uh, sure, oil and gas and coal have shifted around a bit, but we're still looking at 80% of global energy supply still coming from fossil fuels. The other thing is, one of the good news stories, of course, is we've had this huge boom in renewables, but that 0.1% in 73 is uh, solar and wind. And you can see today it's still only 2.2% in 2019. So despite, uh, despite what we're seeing across the globe, there's still a lot of work to be done. There's hundreds of graphs you could uh, show to, to, to realize how big the challenge is. That's just one example of how far we have, how far we have to come if we're going to transition the energy sector or transform. And of course, that's another debate we can have as well. Now, one of the principal reasons for the failure uh, of climate policy has been opposition from those incumbent industries, oil, coal, and gas. In fact, as many of you would know, fossil fuel companies have been running multi-million dollar campaigns, questioning the science of climate change for decades, online campaigns, social media campaigns, funding front groups and the like. And of course, it's worked. You just have to look at that. But as we know as well, with debates over the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, debates over Labor's new climate policy now, uh, we're going to continue to see uh, lobbying and other activities from industries that stand to win or lose from different climate policies. So today, I want to look at two questions. Firstly, how has business obstructed action on climate change? And then secondly, of course, the question I think a lot of us who want policy to catch up to the science is, okay, well, what do we do about it? How do we design policies that might enable more ambitious climate action? So before I jump into that, let me say a little bit about the methods and the data that I'm gonna draw on to answer those two questions. Um, I'm gonna draw on a mix of some quantitative and qualitative work from different projects and put them all together here. Um, so the first bit of data is quantitative data. It comes from a project I'm working on with Professor Robert Brawl. We've been tracking the revenue and spending of trade associations in the United States over the last decade. So a lot of that data comes from looking, essentially looking through their tax filings. I can say more about that uh, in the Q and A if people are interested. But basically, we went through all their tax filings over the last decade and tracked how much money they were getting in revenue and how much they were spending and what were they spending it on. Uh, the second uh, source of data is um, interviews that I've done over the last seven or eight years now, probably getting close to 130, 140 interviews with senior executives across oil, gas, coal, utilities, solar, wind, uh, and some policymakers in the United States but also spending some time hanging out and um, talking and interviewing some of the lobbying firms that work for many of these organizations and the trade associations that represent them as well. So happy to say a lot more about those two sets of data and the databases. Um, but today I thought maybe I'd just focus on the empirics and the policy contribution and less so on the method and, and some of the theoretical contributions that I hope this work makes as well. Okay, so to the first question, how has business obstructed climate action? Well, this was perhaps not the specific question that I first started out with when I sat down and did these interviews, right? I just asked many of these lobbyists, you know, what were they doing? How are they seeking to shape policy in Washington, DC? But most of them were reasonably candid and they spoke, uh, and a lot of these interviews were done during the Obama years. They spoke about how they were building coalitions of different firms across industries, to block climate action, how they were running quite sophisticated public relations campaigns, targeting key constituencies, swing states and so forth, um, how they were funding different community groups that they hoped might come out and ring their local congressman or congresswoman and so forth. 
Um, so there, were the, there was quite sophisticated different activities going on sequenced in a way to hopefully uh, block um, President Obama's attempts to implement firstly an emissions training scheme and in his second term, of course, a clean power plan. Now, there's a whole range of things they were doing, and I think there's a number of explanations for why business has been largely successful. But there's two characteristics I wanted to draw our attention to today. The first is what you might call the resource gap. Um, and this is where I want to draw on some of that work tracking uh, revenue and spending by trade associations. So trade associations, for those of you who aren't familiar, they're essentially uh, an organization that represents the commercial interests of a particular industry or subsector of an industry. So in Australia, most of you will be familiar with groups like the Minerals Council of Australia or ARPIA, which represents oil and gas. Um, in the US, the most prominent ones in the energy sector is the American Petroleum Institute um, or some of the peak bodies like the US Chamber of Commerce. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about trade associations. So we looked at 87 trade associations that had been engaging on climate change issues between 2008 and 2018. The takeaway, the headline that we found is that they spent in that decade, this is just on political activities, they spent $3.4 billion trying to shape policy. That's just trade associations. Um, so what I want to talk about is the inequity or the resource gap between those industries that typically come out and support climate action and those that don't. So let's have a look at their revenues. As you can see up here, this is shown by industry. Um, so across the energy sector of the 87 trade associations that we looked at, they had total revenues of $25 billion or $25.6 billion, I should say, across that decade. The largest there is in purple, that's the oil and gas industry. Um, you can see there $4.57 billion in revenue across that decade. The next largest is the peak trade associations, that is trade associations that cover multiple industries. So the US Chamber of Commerce, the Business Roundtable, that's them in orange. If we think about the climate politics literature, we can make some kind of descriptive inferences about the types of industries that are typically opposed and those that typically are support. And I'm speaking crudely, but coal, rail, steel, oil and gas, utilities and transport, typically have come out in opposition to climate policy in the US over the last decade. Um, if you total up their revenues, you're looking at um, about $14.3 billion for those industries. If you cast your eye down to the bottom right-hand corner there, you can see the renewable energy sector, oil, uh, sorry, solar, wind, hydro, uh, geothermal and others, their revenue compared to 14.3 billion is 580 million. So huge resource gap in the types of money that these industries have. If you were to include peak trade associations, which we don't, but if you would include them on either side, you'd be thinking about 18.3 billion. So clearly, whichever way you look at it, uh, the industries that typically oppose climate action are outgunning those that tend to come out in favor of climate policy in the US. I'd also argue that those kind of rough estimates I'm giving you are conservative because there's a whole not a whole series, but there's a number of uh, studies that have been published in the last few years showing, for example, that the agriculture sector has done a lot to oppose climate policy in the US. And we haven't, you can see them there in the light blue, but I'm not including them in that, uh, that description. Okay, so that's the revenue. Let me turn now to the spending. So if you look at the spending, you can see that, again, spending, as you'd expect, spending by industry is typically opposed. That's the top, far up the top, way outweighs what we're seeing here from the supporting industries in blue. So trade associations overall spend about 13% of their revenues on political activities. So that $3.4 billion represents about 13% of their revenues. As you can see there, oil and gas in purple up the top is by far the largest spender. Um, no other sector spent in excess of $1 billion. The peak trade associations in orange and the top right up there were the next biggest spender. But again, you compare these to what we're seeing being spent by, um, by the renewable industries, by solar, by wind, by geothermal and others. That little portion there in blue is $74 million compared to $2 billion on the other side of the equation. 
So a huge gap in what we're seeing being spent by different industries. So that's one uh, thing that I wanted to draw attention to is just essentially the, the, the resource gap between different industries and what they're spending on politics. The second thing I wanted to emphasize is the kind of complexity and sophistication of the political activities that many of these industries are using. Um, so if you look at the political science, which is huge literatures on lobbying and political contributions and so forth in political science, not so much on some of the other activities. In part, that's because it's easy to track spending on some of those activities. But business does a lot more than simply lobbying or political contributions. They also do huge advertising, public relations campaigns. Um, they also give huge amounts of grants to third parties. And I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. But what was really good about this data that's disclosed through the IRS, the, basically the tax body in the US, is when you go through their spending and revenue data, you can, you can disaggregate it for essentially for political activity. They say, we spent this on a public relations, we spent this on lobbying. And so if you tally it up, you can actually look at their spending across different political activities, which is what we've done here. And you can see that spending on advertising promotion, $2.2 billion there, way outweighs to a great extent what they're spending on lobbying. So typically we think about lobbying, but actually they're spending vastly more on advertising and prom uh, advertising promotion, 2.2 billion versus uh, $729 million there. Interestingly, because there's a lot of attention often on political contributions to parties and candidates, the smallest activity, if you follow the money like we have here, is political contributions. Um, and in fact, grants, which we often pay no attention to, um, was four times that what they spent on political contributions. So if you pick up a newspaper, you're inclined to think that actually a lot of it is about who's giving money to what candidates, what political action committee. But in fact, it's the smallest thing and they're giving four times that amount of money to uh, via grants. So they gave money to political organizations like the Democratic Association of Mayors or the Republican Governors Association. They gave money to think tanks, universities, charitable organizations, museums, your local community groups. Basically, if you can think of it, they have given money to it, uh, these trade associations. Um, now, we don't have the spending. I'd love that spending data for Australia. We don't have it. Um, money in politics is much worse in the US than it is here, but actually their disclosure practices on a whole range of fronts is much better than Australia's. So obviously we have political donations data here, but not. Um, we don't have the same data around, for example, uh, advertising and promotion. But I think it's, it's fair to assume that most of these industries do similar types of activities here, especially because most of the same corporations, say in oil and gas, many of them are based here as well. But when they combine all these activities, they've been very successful at shaping policy, I think. Um, and they use them in different ways, right? Lobbying is used, say, to get carve-outs in legislation to try and shift the cost burden from one industry to another. They'll use legal strategies, which we haven't even looked at here because we didn't have data on it, but they'll use legal strategies to limit the scope of a particular regulation. Uh, of course, they'll shift forums between jurisdictions depending on where they think they might have the most influence. Um, and of course, in Australia, we see some of this playing out as well. But I think if you don't pay attention to the sophistication uh, of some of these political activities, you can draw incorrect conclusions. And Australia is a good example, right? If you looked at the transport industry right now in Australia, they're out publicly uh, saying that they support the government's approach to net zero emissions. Um, you might intuitively conclude that because EVs are here, it makes sense for them to support climate policies, right? But if we don't pay attention to all the things they're doing, I think that's an incorrect conclusion. And um, we have some evidence of why that might be the case. There was this um, was revealed in the Fairfax papers a few months ago about some secret documents were released from the trade association representing the transport industry in Australia, revealing that they purposefully positioned their self as a solution to climate change with electric vehicles and so forth. But actually they were gonna spend millions of dollars on public relations activities to try and water down attempts by the new Labor government to implement fuel efficiency standards. Um, and this documentation showed as it was reported in the press but basically their aim was for us to continue to have the weakest, well, we don't have fuel efficiency standards, but essentially the weakest fuel efficiency standards in the OECD. Um, so we know that 
the, we know two things, I guess, here is one is the resources, this huge resource gap between different industries, how much money they have to spend on politics. And we also know that they're doing a lot more than we typically pay attention to. That's much more than just political contributions and just lobbying. Um, and sociologists have done a lot of good work in this space as well, I should say. So that's a little bit about the how business um, has been, what have they been doing, I guess, to obstruct climate action and the resources they have to do it. So the second, I want to spend a few moments now talking about how do we design policies to overcome business opposition. Like lots of policies, right? Climate policies invariably involve distributing costs. They put costs on some sections of society and they distribute benefits to others. Um, as anyone studying political economy would tell you, this generates winners and losers. So policymakers in the climate space need to think about two things. One is, how do you develop policies that expand opportunities for decarbonisation? In other words, creating coalitions amongst workers, firms, citizens that might support climate policy. And the second thing is, how do you mitigate the potential political backlash from those groups in society that might stand to lose from climate policy? Now, traditionally, the approach has been uh, to listen to economists. Now, economists generally uh, favour policies that on paper are the most efficient. And yes, emissions trading, carbon prices are typically the most efficient way to reduce emissions. But we also know that often they don't, often they fail politically. This is that infamous shot of the coalition front bench celebrating the removal um, of the carbon price during Tony Abbott's prime ministership in Canberra. So we know that emissions tradings and various attempts to implement a carbon price have failed around the world. One of the reasons that they're so hard politically is because they put the costs, they impose concentrated costs on a powerful few, a powerful few, I should say, well-organized industries, and they distribute the benefits, um, you know, they disperse the benefits across a wide range of groups. To put it in simple terms, right, they front load the costs and back end the benefits. Not the best political strategy if you're trying to get something up in a legislature. Um, and I know Robin's written a bit about this as well. And there's lots of others work that I'm drawing on here too. There's a, there's a really good climate politics literature now talking about these distributive conflicts. Um, so a few lessons that I want to touch on, three, about how we might try and deal with this uh, climate policies. The first I'd argue is we need to think about policies that entrench and build existing interests in support of clean energy. So targeted sector specific policies such as solar subsidies, tax rebates, et cetera, that boost particular industries and are provided to particular household constituencies can grow support. So for an example, in the US, we have the investment tax credit for solar production tax credit for wind, both of these tax credits have been a real boon for both industries. As their revenue has increased, so has their lobbying presence, of course, in Washington, DC. We've got groups like the Solar Energy Industries Association, which is the big trade association in the US representing solar. We've got the Smart Energy Council here and others. These groups now are getting bigger. They're playing, having a larger political role. The logic here is to use climate policies to expand those types of pro-climate coalitions. Um, and that's very much what's at the heart of the Inflation Reduction Act in the US. So this is the big piece of climate, leg it's not just climate legislation, but it's a big piece of legislation that um, the Democrats passed through both houses um, at the end of last year. Um, in Australian dollars, it's $530 billion in spending to advance clean energy. And so they've got billions of dollars in that bill, or in that law now, I should say, for tax credits for solar, wind, geothermal, batteries, um, there's $13 billion in Australian dollars for rebates for Americans to electrify their homes. There's $11,000 rebates to electrify your cars and so on. There's a green bank, et cetera. Huge amounts of money. Part of the thinking there, uh, when you talk to Democrats, part of the thinking is to try and expand industries and coalitions that might come out then and, you know, one, stop these policies being uh, uh, retrenched and two, hopefully come out in support of better and even better, more ambitious climate policies going forward. So that's that's one thing to do. think about. How, how, how do you design policies that might entrench and build existing interests? The second 
lesson that I took away from this is thinking about how you might exploit divisions within and divisions between industries. So climate policy creates direct and it creates indirect costs, right? If you're putting in a renewable energy policy, there's gonna be indirect costs on some fossil fuel industries who might lose market share as a result. As those indirect costs mount, they're gonna push back politically. So how do you limit that political pushback? Well, one way is to think about how you might design policies that exploit the natural divisions between industries. So firms, the preferences of firms are largely determined by their commercial interests, not only their commercial interests, but largely determined by their commercial interests. And as a result, a whole range of industries across the different fossil fuels have quite different commercial interests. So if your aim is to regulate emissions from coal, for example, you might like to think about the natural divisions between those that dig it up, the coal producers, and those that use it, burn it to generate electricity. Electric utilities and coal producers, they're all in the coal supply chain, but they have different commercial interests along the way. And I'm talking here about the corporate level, of course. There are also natural divisions between oil producers and oil refiners, if you go further downstream. The other thing to think about is perhaps when you're when you're thinking about these divisions is to maybe target the most politically weak industry in the first instance, because they're gonna be less likely to be able to push back. Now in the US, and there, I think there was a lot of thinking around this in the Obama years, in the US, the obvious candidate is, is the coal producers. You can see here, this is uh, US coal production over the last 70 years, despite what President Trump and others have said, it continues to decline. So. The coal industry in the US is in steady decline. Um, there's a whole range of economic impacts for that and, and, uh, uh, and justice issues as well. But on the political side, my focus here, it means that their lobbying presence in DC is, is, is shrinking year by year. So when I went and spent time interviewing lobbying firms that work for pharmaceuticals and defense and coal, a lot of them said, you know, yes, we're not, we're not getting as much work from them you know, we're looking for other clients in other sectors and so forth. The American Coal Council, for example, the big trade association that represents the coal industry, doesn't have the same influence that it had, say, in the early George W. Bush years. This comes out in their spending too. So in between 2014 and 2015, which was when President Obama was trying to put in the clean, uh, clean power plan to target emissions from coal, coal producers spent $18 million on lobbying. So a fair amount of money, but electric utilities spent $240 million. So you can see quite easily that you're going to get quite a different uh, pushback. The lobbying campaign, the TV ads that the coal industry can mobilize against, you're quite different to what the electricity, electric utilities can. So thinking about some of these divisions, and I'm talking here about between industries, but we can also talk if people are interested, there's obviously divisions within industries, firms take different positions than and I saw that play out in the coal industry too, where Rio Tinto, for example, took quite a different position to the Peabody and some of the other firms. So entrenching and building existing interests, uh, thinking about divisions within industries. And the final lesson that I wanna talk about is shifting existing interests. Because I think right now, it's probably one of the more important in this country and several others. Policy signals, well, they need to be repetitive but they also need to think about ways that induce significant change in the structure and the investment uh, in different industries. So to give a really like a simple example, if you stick in a renewable energy target, you're compelling utilities to purchase, to essentially change their asset base, right? You're, you're encouraging them to invest in solar and wind assets and over time divesting from coal or other assets. That means their political strategies naturally change. Um, and this has already happened in Australia. If you follow utility baits, I follow them more closely in the US, but here we can see that utilities are playing a different role here than they might have a decade ago. Um, other sets of economic interests are probably at an earlier stage. If we take the transport sector in Australia, like I was speaking a moment ago, um, I don't think they're as far along, right? They're still very much opposed, at least some parts of it are opposed to climate policy. Um, some of you probably know much more about this than me in the Australian context, but I think obviously one of the reasons that people have spoken about why we saw that transport position was because Toyota betted on hybrid cars, not EVs. And so they want to drag out uh, the transition a little bit longer so they can make 
a little bit more money on their hybrids and we don't move too quickly to EV. So different firms and parts of industries have different commercial interests. But if you imagine policies, and we're hopefully starting to see them, huge investments in public infrastructure for charging cars and other things, what you're going to do is you're going to start to shift the interests of different parts of the transport sector. You're going to build new alliances of firms that are there to, to, to you know, build these charging infrastructure. There's going to be maintenance workers. There's going to be a whole range of different groups that are going to have a commercial benefit from these different industries as they emerge. And I think in Australia right now, because of you, we all hear now with uh, um, Prime Minister's talking about too, Australia being a renewable energy superpower. We could go into, I'm not still not sure what superpower means, but we're going to be a renewable energy power. We've got some of the best wind and solar resources in the world. Um, and so thinking about how some of our policies might shift industries, say like aluminium, which have been very emissions intensive, but could potentially move to cleaner, cheaper forms of electricity. Um, if you move some of these industries with policies, you start to bring them out of that column for of industries that oppose climate action to ideally pro, but even if they abstain from the debate, that's still a much less political pushback. So thinking about policies that support new clean industries um, and help them to shift. Well, I'll leave it there because I'd like to have uh, plenty of time to, to you know, have a discussion here a little bit about your work. Um, I guess the main, the main the main point I wanted to make is to think about how we design policies that overcome this opposition. The one other point that I haven't mentioned is the speed. We all probably, for those of you that aren't climate scientists like myself, we probably duck our head in every now and again and look at the latest climate science. And you don't need to know too much to realize the science is way over here and policy hasn't caught up. So the other point here is we need ambitious targets for our power sector, for our transport sector, for our manufacturing sector because markets won't get us there alone. They're simply not fast enough, right? And I think you know, a really good illustration of that is electric vehicles. General Motors have been working on electric vehicles for about 20 years. Tesla, probably more than 10 years. Globally, total new car sales, less than 10% are EVs. In Australia, total new car sales, I think for last year, less than 4% were EVs. So how are we gonna to get to 100% adoption rates. Well, we can rely on markets. It'll probably happen, but it's not going to be quick enough. So I think we need governments to mandate these changes to happen and then invest the money uh, to, uh, to make the transition as quick as possible. Of course, as these industries prosper, not only is our air going to become cleaner, but we're going to have new coalitions, new allies in support of clean energy policies. Of course, none of this will be easy, but I think with political momentum building in Canberra and a number of other capitals around the world, governments not only need to act urgently to address climate change policy, but I hope what I've uh, shown today is they need to act in ways that win the political debate as well. Thank you very much. If you like more information, there's a few things up there. That's my quick promo, so then I'll get out of it. Cheers. We have plenty of time for questions, so the floor is open. Yeah. 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 Uh, the question at the uh, risk of being impolite: Are these incremental changes, which are perhaps better than nothing, are they enough, or are we fiddling our own birds, or more broadly? Is ecological modernization enough? Or do we, as climate justice activists, say system change, not climate change? Now, again, a lot of different ideas on what system change we need, but I'll throw that out into the mix. So, you're going to start with the easiest questions first, and I appreciate that. Uh, look, there's probably others like Robin that are that may be better placed to answer that. It, de it depends how you're measuring it, right? I think if you look at, are we going to meet, are our policies going to get us to 1.5 degrees? No. Are they good enough then? No. Are we going to get to two degrees? Probably not. Uh, I think privately, um, climate scientists would say that, you know, two degrees might be almost gone as well. So clearly, our policies are not matching what the science says we need to do to stop the bushfires, to stop the floods. Um, how we get there, uh, 
what types of theories, you know, you just mentioned eco ecological modernization and others. Um, there's different frameworks to think about this, but as far as the, you know, the, the practical point of your question, no, we need to be doing a lot more. We need much more ambitious policies. System change, yes, but the, the, we have this huge problem, right, that we, we have to be moving, you know, we have to be, what's that old analogy about rebuilding the Boeing as it's flying in the air? Uh, so we need to, we can't wait for a huge system change in a decade because we need to be reducing emissions now. So this also goes to your theory of change. How do you think is the best way to change uh, the current system we have and reduce emissions quickly? And that's probably a, a whole other Pandora's box. But right. change now, but we need to conceptualize it. Uh, and there's very little theory that we need to conceptualize it. Yeah, no, no, completely good point. And of course, that also comes back to who stands to lose under different systems, which I think we can see that there's particular industries that would push back quite strongly politically in response to, to policies along that nature. And so we need to think about, well, how do we, how do we address that? Thanks. Thank you, Christian. Um, brilliant talk and really interesting to hear, um, I think. You, you talked about, um, you know, how trade associations in the U.S. Um, are, are getting in the way of the sort of ambitious climate policy. Um, uh, and you mentioned this, you know, very significant policy change in the, in the IRA um, that's just come into being. So I'd be, I'd be interested in your reflections on what led to that major sort of climate policy need. Um, uh, and I'm asking that, I guess, from the perspective of trying to understand are there things that coalitions of you know people who are seeking more ambitious policy could could, could learn from um, and that potentially bring to the Australian effort? Yeah, thanks. That was a good question. Uh, um, unfortunately, I haven't done a lot of study on you know why why the success with the IRA. Um, there are people, there's, there's, a, there's a couple of workshops being proposed right now on that topic in the US. It'll be really interesting to see what social scientists kind of conclude. But I think there's a, a few, I mean, obviously the numbers in Congress and there's the things on the surface we can look at. Uh, but coming back maybe to this graph here, is that maybe some industries are shifting. So we, this data was 2008 to 2018. M my inclination, just talking to a few folk when I was in the US last year is, you know, parts of the transportation, so the red and the utilities, the green, are probably shifting. Parts of those industries are shifting in ways they weren't during the Obama years, in part because their commercial interests are shifting, right? They've already started divesting out of coal. Uh, firms like GM now are moving more quickly into electric vehicles. Um, some of the big utilities like Duke, were, Duke Energy were much more uh, heavily dependent on coal a decade ago than they are today. So I think we're going to, I think we're seeing some of the commercial interests in some of these industries slowly shifting and perhaps their position shifting. Um, anecdotally, at least as reported in the press, we heard as well that um, in those final weeks when Joe Manchin, uh, for those of you that didn't follow the debate, Joe Manchin was that key swing senator from West Virginia, came out and said, the deal's dead, I'm not supporting it. And then a week later said, actually, he, he came to a, an agreement with the majority leader, um, Senator Schumer. Um, and it's reported anyway that he came under huge uh, lobbying from a lot of those clean energy interests, battery manufacturers that might set up in his state of West Virginia, uh, parts of the transportation sector, uh, geothermal and others. So some of these clean green energy or industrial coalitions were starting to come out and play a bigger role. Now, that's just the part that I'm paying attention to. Obviously, there's a lot more going on the ground, huge social movements as well, mobilizing democratic voters and so forth. So, so lots of things going on, but at least... In the part of the equation that I've been paying attention to, I think we're seeing a little bit of a shift uh, in the in the in the kind of industrial configuration there. I'm not sure who was next. Um, there was one. Yeah, I'll let you do it. Probably might be people online too. I've been checking the video. I haven't seen any results yet. Um, Thanks. Really interesting presentation. I was wondering if you could sort of marry up part one and part two in a way, and talk about how we achieve part two, given the huge imbalance in resources. Like part two is really only achievable when you have money behind it, when you have, when you have those resources. And yet it's such a discrepancy. So mm -hmm. 
where do we get those resources from? How do you start to achieve part two? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, well, I, I think it's in part by by doing those three things. It's not the only thing, right? But des designing policies that entrench these industries here, these supporting industries, and help make them as big as you can with subsidies and rebates and so forth. There's a whole range of policies. I just mentioned those. But the bigger they get, we use more energy from them. We reduce emissions, but they become politically stronger. Now, they're not going to be perfect advocates, right? They're going to fight for their own commercial interests, but they're going to be better than... Uh, than a, um, a lobbying space dominated by oil and gas. So you help, you put policies that try to build those climate coalitions. I haven't spoken about unions as well. And then that's another group, of course, that has played a key role in shaping some of these debates. So policies that build alliances between different organized interest groups in society that are gonna be coming out uh, and supporting climate policies. You also think about those industries that can switch. So coal producers, they're coal producers, they're gonna be wound down. But other industries like transportation and utilities, they can switch, right? You don't have to generate electricity from coal. You can generate it from a whole range of other cleaner sources. So putting in place those types of policies that encourage those industries to shift and move into the kind of the supporting industries column. So transportation and utilities, I think, are key. Gas, oil and coal, um, you know, it's going to be much harder to shift those industries. But somewhere like rail, the railroads, the reason in the US that they've been in the opposition is because coal is one of their biggest clients, right? But that doesn't have to be the case either. So thinking about how you shift interests of different industries, I guess that's part of how you marry up that, you know, the resource inequities with the how do we get better outcomes. Can I just, sorry, follow up on that in the sense that you, you talk about putting policies in place, but we only put policies in place when we've got lobbying, when we've got all those resources to get policies put in place. So I guess that's sort of the root of my mm. question is, ultimately I 100% agree with your putting policies in place, but we only get those policies in place when you've got those resources. Yeah. So what we had is to so, do the campaigns. So I'd, I'd, I'd kind of partly agree, but I think the difference is you can put in policies some of those policies to entrench existing interests won't get political pushback right away because the costs are indirect on the fossil fuel interest. And then the other point is this, is thinking about if you're, say, regulating coal um, and targeting, I mean, this is just a hypothetical, right, but targeting producers so you don't get the pushback from the utility straight away. So what you're trying to do is design policies that limit the pushback. Of course, as you say, it's going to be hard, right? <laughs> but we've seen that with big campaigns in different countries, including here, that we do see action. We just need to think about all the ways we can speed it up. Now, there's two questions here, but we do have one from online. So we'll take that one first. Oh, thank you. Um, so there's a question here from Will Hopkinson, who says, hi, Christian, thanks for a great seminar. In the US, how much of the policy or influence competition between fossil fuel and renewable energy groups do you think comes down to their respective material resources? 90% would be my short answer. Um, you know, there's a big literature in business and management and sociology and political science on business preferences and what drives them. Um, different scholars make slightly different arguments, but I think that largely the consensus would be that they're driven by commercial or material interests. Um, and, and to perhaps a smaller extent, they're driven by what some people refer to as their, as kind of institutional factors. This might be the history of the corporation or corporations experience with say different technologies. So they do influence uh, business preferences, but largely it's their material or commercial interests. Um, and one example I mentioned Rio Tinto for another paper, I looked at the top 20 coal producers in the US to see where they, where they stood on um, President Obama's first attempt at emissions trading and then his clean, pol clean power plan. Of the top 20 coal producers in the US, um, all of them came out against both of those policies. The only one that didn't was Rio Tinto, which was in the top 10, I think, from memory, which was quite interesting. So Peabody Energy, Arch Coal, all these groups, as you would expect, came out against policies that are directly targeting their commercial interests or their assets. Rio Tinto didn't. I don't know, I can't be 100% sure why, but if you look, if you, then once you start go, to go back through their annual reports, much more diversified company. And at the time, actually only 8% of their global revenues came from coal production. Most of their revenues came from other, uh, other operations. 
So their commercial interests were quite different to other uh, firms in the US, which were 100% revenues coming from coal. Also, they, they were the only firm based in London. The rest were based in the US. They had experience. This gets to the institutional factor point. They had experience negotiating around emissions trading debates in Europe for a much longer. They took a much less adversarial approach to some of the other firms because of their European experience. So largely material factors, but some of those institutional factors, I think, play a role as well. I don't know why I'm looking at you there, but just kiss you. Yeah, yeah, as a consideration of, of industry in, in the UK is to drug the kind of Kool Aid that has really shifted its position. So that's consistent with you. I think mm -hmm. probably have two people who've been lining up for a while. Um, oh, sorry, you go. You've got the mic. You've got the mic. Oh, you yeah. you've the mic. I just got the mic. So just returning to what you said about. Um, What's really frustrating is that there isn't as much desegregated data in Australia because our disposal law is a shit. Um, and that's quite frustrating. So a lot of my research is sort of quite similar, but um, with food and drink corporations. Um, so just on that question of just corporate political activity, pretty much everything you said here is the same for that. And I'd say the other really big lobbying issue at the moment probably is like e-cigarettes. Um, and like I can think of an example from my own research where basically like Nestle were brought up for a Senate hearing or something in Australia completely did not want to answer a question and change their global policy or something like overnight. And it's quite a big deal. Um, I suppose my question is how much potential is there for collaboration with different issues across different sectors and go actually we're all targeting policies around corporate political activity, not necessarily climate or cigarettes or advertising, whatever it is. Um, because there's very little political will usually for donation, disclosure, reform, or anything. But I suppose, yeah, just um, what are the sort of more strategic levers we can pull uh, with multinational corporations around corporate political activity that may not necessarily be about climate? Mm, yeah, really interesting question. I think it's not we, a lot, so many of us, myself uh, included, we focus on our particular policy mm. domain, right? And there's lessons across policy domains. Um, you know, that, that's one of the things that a lot of these industries have done very well. is taking the lessons from the tobacco industry and, and moving them over here. And a lot of them, the same people, yeah, so, so, so public relations firms like Edelman, right? They've just shifted across. Um, yeah, I think it's a really good point. And, and maybe it's a step before all of this, right? That you're not going to solve, this gets to your question too. Maybe you're not going to solve some of these problems until you deal with the first problem, which is political reform, which is putting in place policies that get as much money out of politics as possible. That looks very different in very different jurisdictions, you know, Western liberal democracies have a whole range of, uh, from presidential systems, parliamentary and so forth. So what that looks like is different in different jurisdictions. But yeah, I'm very much uh, agree with you that thinking about how we might build coalitions across policies that can drive political reform. On methodology, I think that's what I find quite interesting is you also won't say the same stuff that I've read in our literature. Mm. Talk to each other and yeah. strengthen the policy and methodology here. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I just have a question about, so the message I'm hearing is that money wins in terms of policy, which I you know, naively can see that, but I'm also very saddened by that. And some of the research that I look at is the health impacts of gas exploration, for example, and legally, is that okay? And currently in Australia, we're allowed to do it, but legally it's probably not okay. So, um, you know, what, what impact can things like those discussions have on on this so sort of the impact of um, law or even you know there's a lot of work being done looking at insurance and risk and actuarial studies for saying you know you shouldn't really legally be allowed to finance this because we can so you know how does how does that play into these policy arguments yeah thanks i just i want to clarify as well i don't i don't want to say that money always wins my, my research doesn't show that but i think it maybe just shows that it makes it harder um, but obviously there are plenty of occasions where you know different groups mobilize and, and overcome these obstacles but yeah it does it does make it a lot harder um it's really interesting thing about the finance and the in, and the insurance side because there was a, a quite well-known book written i think by jeremy leggett robert might know better than me in the 1990s maybe uh, on climate change and and if my memory is correct, you know, it was talking about how the insurance industry might be this industry, right, that should be out there coming out in support of climate change, particularly this, I think, was in the UN negotiations. But they haven't really played the role that perhaps a lot of activists and others thought they would. Um, I don't know why, but I was, so this is very anecdotal. This is not how you're supposed to do social science research, right? But I was talking to a guy a workshop at a workshop recently who'd worked for the insurance industry, and he said, yeah, that's because they're on like yearly insurance premiums, right? Like they can just 
they can just shut off their customer or just raise it up the next year if the risk changes. Who you really need to be thinking about, which I think the climate movement's already there, is the finance side, right? Because banks have a 30-year mortgage. Insurance industry just has a one year and then they can roll it over or change it. So focusing on banks and other parts of the finance sector, I think, is a much more productive avenue. Um, and I think the insurance industry is perhaps inactivity, at least politically, on this. Um, what about the reinsurance industry? That's an, yeah. So reinsurance. I don't know. Have they come out? Uh, have they been active? They're the ones that all those rich people whose names, yeah. you know, Lloyd names, they have to give up as much money as they can when there's a claim by an insurer on the reinsurer. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them have gone bankrupt mm -hmm. in, in some of the climate disasters over the last decade. So maybe so they don't have a quite different incentive. Yeah. 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 So so banks and the reinsurance, but not the insurance might well, be there. Sure. We know insurance companies can rewrite their contracts yeah. and restrict their market to certain forms of insurance, but I'm not sure about reinsurance. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. But uh, yeah, but insurance industry is obviously like you see in Lismore, they can just raise the premium, so they they're not at the same loss. Uh, but you're seeing huge movements now in the finance sector. I mean, campaigns, right? Targeting. We're doing some different work on export credit agencies, which are public banks that that fund different projects. And there's a big movement now to, to get uh, countries to stop using their public banks to fund coal fired power plants in Vietnam or wherever it happens to be. So yeah, finance and, and sounds like reinsurance too. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Hopefully. Thanks, Christian. Um, one industry that didn't appear there was the tech sector um, mm -hmm. in which you know we've all seen the infographic of Shell and BP and Exxon Mobil being the, the you know top of the couple of um, charts many years ago. Now it's Alphabet, Apple, Microsoft, etc. They've all shifted towards 100% renewables across all their assets. They're also becoming energy consumers, even energy generators. Telstra is switching to supply. What's their role in all of this, and how might they play a more powerful role? particularly in Australia with Mike Cannon Brooks, obviously, you know, seriously shifting uh, stuff at, at AGL and creating the board spill. Where's, where's the sort of tech role in all of this play? Yeah, I think it plays a big role. The reason it's not in here, I, I didn't go into the method in detail, but basically to derive our sample of trade associations, we looked at, we had a couple of sources, but basically we looked at all industries that in, had engaged on climate change issues between 2000 and 2018. So we looked at, um, you know, congressional inquiries, et cetera, and pulled out all the trade associations that had participated. Um, and the clean tech wasn't in that sample. Now, you would be thinking maybe that's changing over the last four years, given that this study ended in 2018 or our data ended in 2018. Um, so that's, that's the first part of your question. Um, I think they play a big role and like any other industry, right, as their commercial interests, as they become big energy consumers, you know, how do you think about policies that ensure, give them the incentives to just rely on clean energy? Um, and, you, you know, there are examples, right? Like I think it's, um, was it Google or Apple? There's a couple of those firms that signed up Solar City, which is another one of, uh, you know, was part owned at the time by Elon Musk as well. Some of these big solar installers to ensure that all of their electricity came from to came from renewable energy. So thinking about because they could be quite an important part of building these these cleaner climate coalitions. The question is, do they get involved? Or like, I don't think they're going to be opponents. That's quite clear. But how might you shift them from abstaining, just watching how it plays out, to actually coming on board and so they're buying the companies. They're buying the companies. Yeah, the consolidation yeah. things you wouldn't think they're buying. Yeah. So the the only other issue there is 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 it enough of their asset base? So it goes back to the Rio Tinto example. If if coal is just a small amount, then Rio Tinto will focus elsewhere on the commercial interest. And if Google's making hundreds of billions of dollars from other things and a small amount from solar, it might not lead them enough to shift their political activities. But thinking about how that might change and how you might introduce policies to encourage them. I think, yeah, it's quite important. Mm. It'd be really interesting to look across like the reports of some of the clean tech companies and seeing what their asset base looks like and where, to what extent they have renewable assets. Okay. Cool.
they've got their own problems, of course. If you're a privacy law activist or something, you might have it. <laughs> yes. Um, a question for us, really, Jeremy, is that um, you uh, there are quite a few government schemes and issues at the moment focusing on upskilling the workforce, particularly related to the crime and literacy. How relevant do you think that is to perhaps you say focusing on commercial interests or maybe around the messaging and the narrative that we create as part of that crime and literacy? And what do you mean when you say climate literacy? So upskilling the workforce in terms of their knowledge about climate change, how it impacts whatever industry you're in, uh, building a renewable energy workforce. Um, upskilling potential sector more broadly yeah. in terms of knowledge of change and how it impacts across the board. Well, uh, I don't know if I'm the best person to say, but um, generally speaking, I think, you know, raising awareness about these issues is important and we're going to need a huge work. Like if we're going to get this transition done, we're going to need a huge amount of think of all the technical trades, right, to, to roll out a lot of this tech and a lot of this infrastructure in rapid time. So there's going to be a huge demand for different skill sets that we don't have or we don't have enough of. I think the other thing, of course, with, with climate literacy is thinking about, you know, the difference between what you see from some of the kind of ESG policies that are put in place that perhaps I think quite, uh, you know, rightly in some instances are not much more than greenwashing compared to what the actions of actually different firms are. So making the distinction between, I guess, what some organisations say they're doing versus what they're actually doing, I think is also a really important part of cl the climate literacy uh, side of things too. Thanks for the question. Yeah, I've got one. Um, but we're in delicate negotiations at the moment in Australia on the so-called safe guard mechanism. And that's been a classic case of Labor basically talking to the 215 largest carbon polluters and designing a scheme that then has a lot of offsetting. Um, so have you looked at that? Who else is at the table? I think Labor are burnt because when they designed their um, energy, clean energy future package under the Real Life government, um, the then climate minister had to sort of accept what the multi-party Commission on Climate Change um, insisted on because they didn't control the house. And therefore they didn't do the usual thing, which is to negotiate with industry before they announce anything. What Greg Conway did was go to industry after he'd already worked out the package to consult, and they were furious, mm. absolutely furious. So I can see this time they're not doing that, which is a pity because this came from the people's representatives who are at the lower house. So what's going on now and, and how might you're focusing on the concentrated losers, how might the diffuse beneficiaries organize and get some representation mm. in those back of house inside the handy bureaucracy negotiations? And that's where it's all being cut. Because mm. we know that that baseline was way beyond the actual production targets of companies. So it was impossible to go over for it to ever work. So they're lowering those baselines. Um, but we don't know how tight. And that's what will determine the effectiveness of this new. Baseline credit statement, mm. which does put a price on carbon that no one's mentioned. <laughs> so, do you know anything about who else is lobbying there or, and who's lobbying? We know it's the Australian Minerals Council and the gas industry in particular. Yeah, I have. So, I've been following the debate just as a citizen, not as a researcher. So, I don't know pre precisely who's lobbying. Um, my guess is all the usual interests, right? <laughs> I wouldn't be, I mean, the Minerals Council up here, all of those groups are no doubt there. Um, but I think that point you're making about the baseline, right? If they're going to meet, if if they shift that, and they get they're talking, what is it about five percent reductions a year? I think for some industries, a bit less than this, less, a bit less than that. Is that they're going to rely then on carbon offsets? And this gets to this big debate, which we're seeing around the integrity of these offsets and what and, and whether we want to be relying on offsets to meet our emissions targets. Uh, and then not chopping down trees that are low tech. So there's, yeah, there's so I'm not an offset expert. There's probably other people in the room that know a lot more about this than me. But I think um, that is one avoided deforestation. There's things to deal with methane from waste. There's savanna burning, for example. There's a whole range of different methodologies, but a number of them have been um, come under pretty strong criticism uh, recently. And Ian Chubb, the former chief scientist, has just done a review into it. It's so forth. So yeah, my big concern with the scheme is around the integrity of the offsets and whether offsets simply become a way to enable business as usual mm -hmm. yeah. but i can't speak to specifics because i haven't been following it 
some of the notes in which I made <laughs> for the last we run out of time. So on behalf of the audience in person and Will and others out there in um, virtual land, I'd like to thank you very much, Christian, for a really, really interesting bit of data presentation and to his part of it. So thanks very much. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for coming along. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for putting it all together. Thank you so much. Interesting work.